This podcast of the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs is sponsored by AAA Heating and Air. The premier HVAC company in the Midlands is growing. Are you a top HVAC technician? AAA Heating and Air is looking for dedicated applicants to fill their fast-growing service department with top-notch HVAC technicians. If you're the best, then they want you. If you're ready to stop working and start a career, you can earn up to $100,000 plus a year at AAA Heating and Air. Quality candidates will have at least two years' experience and a good driving record. Benefits include top industry salaries, commission on service and unit sales, set call limits, company-provided take-home vehicle and gas card, company-provided cell phone and tablet, help, dental, and vision benefits, 401k retirement plan with company match and scaled PTO based on length of service. Contact Roy and Dana Finley at 803-677-1500 or check out their job postings on Facebook or ZipRecruiter. Triple A air when you need us. Triple A heating and air. 11 o'clock Monday morning. Welcome into the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs as Reaction Monday. Rolls along here on the game. Tyler, Wes, and Chris along with you. And unfortunately, we are talking about the end of the road for South Carolina's 2023 football season with a 16-7 to loss to Clemson at williams Bryce Stadium on Saturday night. And, you know, I started off the 9 o'clock hour talking about this. I was trying to think of a the right word to describe what we saw on Saturday night. And I keep going back to deflating because you just didn't see anything, especially from an offensive standpoint that – Gave you really any hope that South Carolina was going to be able to put anything together to win this game? Yeah. Um, in, in some ways, a game that is hard to sum up. In other ways, a game that is very easy to sum up. And, you know, I think in a lot of ways, guys, it kind of like the issues we've seen all season long when South Carolina has not won games, just we're, we're right there again for the most part. Now, you know, I, I didn't have – two turnovers in the first three plays on my bingo card. I didn't have South Carolina being the team that, you know, kind of handed Clemson some points in in this one. And we knew going in, here's the thing, we knew going in that South Carolina was probably going to need a little help from Clemson and that they weren't going to be able to give them help. The the interesting thing after watching the game for four quarters, you kind of look at it and you're like, I don't know if, South Carolina even needed help from Clemson. They just didn't need to shoot themselves in the foot. And I, I think talking to Gamecock fans that I'm tight with, that's probably the most frustrating part right now is that that was a very winnable football game. You, you just didn't execute, and it was something off the bat that you just – you really can't have happen where everybody just stops uh, on that play. And, um, you know, if, if there's any doubt in your mind that it might be backwards or, or – you know, parallel, then you, you got to at least try to go tackle somebody. And, um, you know, that, that was an omen for what was to come. I, I actually, to be honest, y'all, I thought when South Carolina had the worst start you could possibly have, and then they did answer back. It was 7-7. Crowd was back into it. Defense was playing well. And, um, you know, that drive, you sort of look at it, you're like, okay, they ran the football a little bit. They threw it a little bit. Um, there's open receivers. After that drive, I was like, okay, they they may just go win this game. And then Clemson just got stop after stop after stop. And many of them were three and outs. So that there was just no I, I think Spencer Rattler used the word rhythm. Um there was just no rhythm uh, on offense. And uh, you know, if you go into a game, you give up no offensive touchdowns to the opponent. And your opponent doesn't even enter the red zone. <laughs> um, Clemson entered the red zone when they were running the clock out at yep, the end. Yeah, meaningless. Yeah. They they did not enter the red zone in normal time. Yeah. You you, you should win you that You expect game. to win that game at home. The the frustrating part is um Clemson scored sixteen points. As you said, the, the thing that everybody will harp on is no offensive touchdowns. Clemson scored 16 points. And I think even a Clemson fan who despises South Carolina more than life itself could recognize that 13 of them were gifts in some ways. Now, you said one of them was certainly a gift. There's no arguing, right? A very close bang-bang play. Credit Khalil Barnes, really talented freshman for Clemson picking up that football and running it back. An alert play. South Carolina, not as alert. 
Okay, but that's a gift. Shout out to the guy that held Xavier Leggett's ankles as well, so he couldn't run him down. That's right. So Smart play. Seven points there, the only touchdown they scored. All right. Then you have another situation. It, first, you had the day trader turned into Martin Gramatica, or pick your kicker, inexplicably. Pick. <laughs> the stockbroker guy. Um, credit him, right? They made those field goals. But South Carolina had a pick in their hands and dropped it. Whoa. Hard to swallow. Again, now maybe a guy missed the field goal. You got pretty good field position, go score. But you had a pick that literally ends the drive. Instead, they get three. The next one, now you got 10 points. So, point 13, 11, 12, 13 comes from Cade Klubnik. Yeah, throws it away. Looked pretty in the tackle box to me. It was, call, clo- it was close. It was close. Okay. So let, let's say 10 points at a minimum were gifts. And, and we can argue about 11, 12, 13. Throws it away. He make a, another, what, a 49-yard kick that time. Again, credit to him. The point is, it's not like Cle- some of these past games where Clemson's getting stop after stop after stop, and then they're just going up and down the field on you. That was not the case this time out. And, um, you know, the Gamecocks, they only got – the one offensive touchdown, they had opportunities for others. You had, you know, the the pick uh, or the the drop early, and then you had the pick where you had somebody wide open. You had a Marion Brown coming across the field wide open. Another thing. So just a lot of self-inflicted stuff when you, when you look at this game, and that's what's going to make it really, really hard to swallow. Yeah, Cle- Clemson's defense, they, they did lock in as the game went on, but yeah. I, I thought, man, I thought early on especially. And, and then even as the game went on, uh, you know that that's a good Clemson secondary, but there there were some open guys. There really were yeah. watching it um, in the stadium, but there was just so much pressure on Rattler. And you know, I I wondered watching it live. I was like, all right, is there this much pressure, or has the pressure just sort of mounted to where he is seeing ghosts? And my gut feeling watching it live was maybe in some of these cases, you know, he might be seeing ghosts. Going back watching it, y'all. <laughs> I mean, it was mostly real pressure on on yeah. a ton of these throws. Yeah, and we obviously we put a lot into like the pro football focus grades for, you know, position groups and stuff like that. And look at the numbers coming away from Saturday night. This was the second lowest overall score in pass blocking, uh, only behind the Tennessee game and the lowest run blocking game for the offensive line, which, you know, Finally, in the month of November, we got the cohesion of having the same starting five over and over and over again, and we thought that was going to be the mark of them showing some improvements, and unfortunately, they haven't, and it came to a head once again on Saturday night. Well, and another thing, because I don't want people to get the idea that I'm saying, oh, well, South Carolina just, because we get irritated when people say that, I, like Kentucky. We just gave them the game. You know, sure. we gave South Carolina the game. Certainly, South Carolina gave them some things. Even the most hardcore Clemson supporter would have to admit that. But Clemson earned a lot of what they got, right? The defensive effort, as you said, Wes, after that, especially up front. That's where they really kind of made their money. They were really good up front. South Carolina couldn't run it all consistently after, I don't know, the first quarter. Lots of pressure. They were very aggressive. They broke up some passes that were probably catchable balls, right? They did a really nice job with all that. And South Carolina got stops when needed. Nicky Minwari had the great interception with Clemson driving. They – they got some key stops, but Clemson was able to do just enough offensively. And if you go and look at the rushing numbers, some of it skewed by that last drive, right, where they're running the ball. Clemson didn't run it great despite the numbers, but they well, here's what they were able to do. They got some first downs. They were able to flip the field and put South Carolina in another thing that we've seen a lot of the year, negative field position, which against that Clemson defense was going to be really tough. And they were able to have Maffa and Shipley get four yards a carry on some occasions, whereas South Carolina had the nightmare scenario, too many negative plays, too many plays where you got nothing, and then getting into unfavorable downs and distances. Yeah. And then, you know, one of the few times South Carolina did flip the field position back to Clemson, there's right at 10 minutes to go in the game. And... um you know, I, I think that's a decision you can kind of, you know, Beamer was asked about it. That's a decision you can kind of question. Um, and, and I think it was it was obvious to me, and then he gave the, his answer, but it was obvious to me that South Carolina sort of had poor 
field position for a good portion of the game. And he's saying, all right, we finally flipped the field position. Let's pin them back and let's try to force a three and out and then restart this set of downs with similar field position. You're looking for one of those situations. We see it all the time. Unfortunately, we saw it a lot this year when South Carolina was on offense where a team pins a team back, they have to call the game conservatively, and then they punt the ball back, and you end up getting the ball back right around midfield, which is exactly where you were on fourth down before. Like, we've seen that scenario. Yeah, and that was a fourth and seven from Clemson's 49-yard line. And again, with how the offense had been performing at that point, did you really have confidence that we're going to be able to get seven yards on fourth down probably not and again it was an opportunity to maybe finally flip the field position on Clemson for once and obviously it uh, didn't end up turning out in the favor that South Carolina wanted it to yeah and I you know what I you're kind of choosing between two two bad situations there honestly like there's no perfect decision if you go for it there and you don't get it um is the game over no is the game Pretty close to being over, probably. But again, you're probably uh, handing them at least another maybe three points in that scenario because they only have to go 20-some-odd yards to get in field goal range. Yeah, but also I, I think when you're when you're looking at an end-of-game situation, fourth-quarter situation, you're kind of always, I believe, thinking, all right, where, do my, where am I going to make my last stand? And, you know, I, I think hindsight, it's easy to say it with hindsight, you should have went for it because Clemson was able to get a few first downs, keep the clock moving, um, they flipped the field position right back on South Carolina. Um, you know, in hindsight, you just roll roll the dice, I, I think, and go for it there because, honestly, you know, for, fourth and seven from midfield, probably a better situation than than what they ended up in. And um, you know, at some point, you you have to just sort of say, hey, we're making our stand here. Let's let's try to get the ball to get on this on one play and now. Are your chances, like they said, good to convert it? Probably not, based on what we saw. But, it, again, I'm using hindsight. Were your chances, when you took over, after Clemson flipped the field position, were your chances good at driving the entire length of the field twice, or at least once, and then putting yourself, you know, we'll see what happens, um, to try to get down there the second time? Probably not either. Yeah, absolutely. And again, we'll continue to react to what we saw on Saturday night. Get some of your old reactions as well. Uh, Firehouse Subs text line 803-404-6100. We'll hear what Coach Beamer had to say about the offense. Uh, coming up, you're listening to the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs on a Reaction Monday here on the game. Side, reverse play, back to the Luke Doty. Luke trying to cut back into the end zone. Touchdown, Carolina. Touchdown, Luke Doty. A reverse to Doty. They were going to throw to Rattler and Doty with a great cut, Tommy, at the five-yard line. I would not believe the Myrtle Beach native would have gotten in. Great instincts. Welcome back into the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs here on the game as well as the 107.5 The Game app. Download the 107.5 The Game app on the App Store and listen wherever you are. That was calling the Gamecocks Radio Network, the lone touchdown for the Gamecocks on Saturday uh, in the 16-7 to loss to Clemson. Luke Doty getting in on that play down there by the goal line. And really, that's about the only thing you can hang your hat on the offense was scoring that one touchdown on a long, sustained drive, which, again, is something that South Carolina has not done a whole lot of this year. But if you're going to score on Clemson, that's what you have to do. And uh, South Carolina was not able to generate any explosive plays. And after that touchdown, ran a total of one play in Clemson territory, that being that controversial fourth down that we saw in the fourth quarter but yeah I mean really just nothing to generate on offense yeah just couldn't get anything going couldn't get rhythm going um like Chris was alluding to last uh, you know last segment there were some kind of competitive plays down the field where you know some of them you call drop some of them are just incomplete passes but you kind of I think give credit to Clemson's uh, DBs for for making plays on the ball and, and kind of separating the football I thought um, you know, they were very competitive down the field. And, you know, I, I thought that's something if you if you really go back and look at how we kind of framed up this game, I I kind of think that it, it the factors we thought were gonna be important were important in in this game. Like Clem, Clemson had the approach we thought they played man coverage. They they said, Hey, we're gonna force you to, to kind of win these one on one battles. South Carolina didn't win enough of them, at least in not in time. Um to, to where Rattler actually had time to find them 
uh, I think. So the the key, the biggest, single biggest factor in this game was up front. Clemson's defensive line and linebackers against South Carolina's O-line, I think. That was, if you take away everything else, that was the deciding factor. However, there, as always, were a lot of other little things involved there. And um, real quick, though, how about the Lucas Doty stick your foot in the ground, get up filled, um, very heady play by Doty there on what was um, basically kind of a version of the old Philly special. It was not the exact same as the Philly special that uh, the Eagles scored on in the Super Bowl, but it was definitely um, definitely appeared to be as Doty was looking to to throw the football and then cut it up field for a, a touchdown. The 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 funny thing about the play, like you said, a little bit different than the Philly special, but um, half redneck, half posh. 100% fun. Trey Croward and Corey Ryan Forrester try and learn fancy culture in putting on airs. The host of the Medium Popcorn Podcast, Brandon Collins and Justin Brown. Okay, so Paddington 2 had like 100% of Rotten Tomatoes As for you. Should. You guys ruined that? Justin came in and like took it down like two points because of his rating. That's the time we started getting death threats. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not surprised. I didn't know. People worship that movie. Putting on airs. The podcast is on YouTube and wherever you listen. That play... I'm, I'm going to take us down a rabbit hole that I won't keep us on it too long. But it uh, it was a play that Dowell Loggins, when he was with the Bears, uh, it was actually run. They called it the Clemson special because Chad Morris ran it there. And before that, it was at a high school in Texas. And it was actually – let me give a shout-out. Maybe maybe he listens. There's, there's a, actually a baseball coach from South Carolina, Hunter Spivey, and basically uh, – or it was he's a football coach, sorry, and it was drawn up like on a baseball field by him, and then it has proliferated all the way up to the NFL. So pretty cool, pretty cool wow. stuff. SI actually did a story on it a while back. Maybe I, I need to link out that story at some point. But yeah, really good heady play by Doty. You 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 had to have it there. Uh, you know, you, you don't get that. That was an opportunity where like you had to be aggressive. You, know, you had to go try to score a touchdown there. Uh, they were able to get it, but. To go back to what you said, Wes, like when you look at this game, I think there were certainly some opportunities um, that you weren't able to capitalize on. Clemson was just better than you on a lot of those plays. But South Carolina wasn't as equipped this year to overcome the hole that they dug early, right? They did answer after that first, you know, defensive score for Clemson but you just couldn't answer throughout the course of the game. You weren't able to be good enough offensively to go and kind of match what they were doing. You contrast that to last season. You know, South Carolina throws a pick six early against Clemson. Uh, Clemson scores a touchdown early on offense, which they didn't do this game. You had a, a, you know, kind of the opposite of what happened this year, that you get down to the red zone. After a big fourth down play, you get down the red zone, you throw a pick, right? Last year, they were more explosive at at that point in the season. They were able to, you know, wrangle more offensively. They, they couldn't do that this year. You, you just – you weren't as good up front. You didn't have the receivers. You didn't have the time, basically. I think we saw the last two games of the season what this – you know, we, we always kind of talked about it and wondered about it. What would this offense look like if they didn't have the explosive plays, which they were so reliant on? And from a South Carolina perspective, you you're kind of hoping eventually. All right, we're going to get the running game going. We're gonna we're gonna balance this out a little bit. The most balanced game we saw for South Carolina offensively, to me, had to be the Florida game. It's a game you lost, obviously, but offensively, that was the most consistent we saw the offense go. You know, go up and down the field. And even then, there were a couple of little moments where, you know, you had a few three and outs. But still, I, I think it's just. When you rely on those big plays and then you just aren't getting them, um, you know, it, it kind of puts you in a rut offensively. And you can even feel there's something that's almost hard to describe, but there is momentum to an offense a- as well. And this, I mean, look look at the Kentucky game last week. South Carolina just is beating its head against the wall for, um, you know, the better part of like two full quarters um, or more. And then... They have a third and long, and they hit that dig play to Leggett for a first down. And it was just, it was kind of like, all right, 
here we go. Like, let's get some tempo. Let's get some rhythm. Um, Rattler, you know, kind of was able to stand in there and, and deliver the football. And then you even felt that a little bit on the drive that ended up, they ended up punting on the fourth and seven. They finally got a first down to start the drive. Um, and, you know, the stadium kind of buzzes a little bit. There, There is a rhythm and a, a momentum that comes along with kind of getting that first first down in a drive. And, you know, we, we got to do, like Chris said, we got to give some of that credit back to Clemson's defense. But um, they just kept South Carolina mm-hmm. from even getting going with that first first down of a drive that kind of starts to give you that rhythm and that momentum. So, you know, I think credit to them. South Carolina did give them some things, but Clemson's defense um, definitely showed out in this game. And we knew this was going to be a challenge with the front seven that Clemson was bringing in, you know, one of the toughest ones South Carolina's seen all season. And with South Carolina living so much on the explosive plays, you got to be able to have your quarterback sit back there and have the time to let plays develop, let guys get downfield. I think he only ended up getting off seven passes that went greater than 10 yards on Saturday night, which, again, if you don't have that much time and he had to flush the pocket several times and, and tuck and run as well, like you're not going to be able to generate those plays downfield. And, again, South Carolina wasn't able to do that, didn't hit any explosive plays, and uh, they kind of showed them the results on Saturday. And, and they dialed them up, y'all. Like they, they were trying to get the ball down the field. It just, um, you know, th- there was at times just not time to do it. And, uh, I mean, Look, look no further to me in that South Carolina kind of knew what they were up against in the fact that they ran that version of the Philly special, you know, fourth down from the one. And uh, so I, I think – now the I, I have seen some people complaining on Twitter, oh, my gosh, you ran a double reverse from the one-yard line. Um, well, the original Philly special, which was held as like the greatest call in the history of the modern game of football – was run from just outside the one-yard line. So it's not some insane take. Teams do that on two-point conversions or fourth downs all the time. They come up with a trick play down there. But that that was an early sign, I think, mm-hmm. of exactly what South Carolina knew they were up against with that Clemson front against their offensive line. They would never publicly say, oh, we knew, we knew our offensive line couldn't block them for a yard. But you're not running – the double reverse pass when you need a yard if you feel really good about knocking them back i think Let, so. let's go let's go another hindsight question okay so south carolina threw the ball what 32 times in this game mm-hmm. and had what ended up being 24 rush attempts spencer rattler was sacked twice hindsight do you just do you throw the ball even more because i watching the game I'm not saying South Carolina would have won in that instance. Like, you can't point to any aspect of the offense and say that it was good, right? Sometimes you exit a game and you go, why didn't you do this particular thing? It seemed to work, right? Like, you got away from the run or you got away from the pass. We didn't see anything where you could go, well, you got away from this and it was working. Nothing worked consistently enough. But could you have put more on Spencer Rattler in this game and thrown it even more? Maybe fair, right? I mean, Clemson only had, and not this is a great number, they had six tackles for loss. Less than I thought coming in. Um, less than I thought after watching the game even. So Some some of that, I think, R- Rattler got the ball out. He did. Um, it just a lot of times was he's having to throw the ball away or it's, it's getting kind of just – there's not space to actually step in there and throw. There was, and, there was a lot of drops, too, on Saturday. A lot of receiver drops, too. That didn't help. Yeah, well, that but that goes back to what I'm – I think you look at some of those drops. From a South Carolina perspective, you're like, hey, you got to catch the football. If you're Clemson's secondary coach, you're like, hey, our guy got in there and, like, yeah. you know, sort of disrupted the play. It might not, be, not, even, might not even be a PBU in the book, but they're creating contact – when the ball is getting there. So I, I think I give some credit to Clemson on those. How, how many throws from Rattler were j- – that even were completions were just a little bit – all the guy had to slow up yeah, right. because he's throwing it under duress. Um, you know, the, the play that – and this one wasn't under duress, but the play um, before South Carolina ends up going for it on fourth and one down at the goal line, um, you know – 
he probably won't set throw back. He wants to lead Leggett into the end zone as opposed to Leggett having to turn around and, and kind of come back to the ball. Right, and again, dismal performance from the offense on Saturday. Defense did the best it could. We'll hear what Coach Beamer had to say about that coming up. It's the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs on a reaction. Uh, we've, you know, started, we, we mixed up schemes a little bit more here over the last few weeks and, and uh, playing a little bit more three down. We did the bulk of that tonight as well. And, and then guys just continuing to just gain in confidence and, and make plays. Guys like Bam Scott and guys like Jaron Willis and Debo and Stone and our guys up front. You know, we got a good group of guys on defense. I feel like we did a really good job of putting them in position to make plays over the last month. And, and uh, they played, like I said, they played well enough tonight. You hold the other team to three field goals. You um, And you got Spencer Rattler, at quarterback. You like your chances. And uh, just couldn't get over the hump tonight. But, you know, proud of our defense and the way they – got better as the um, as the year went on. Welcome back in. Gamecock Central Takeover Hour presented by our friends at Firehouse Subs. Of course, Shane Beamer talking Gamecocks defense. And, I mean, Chris, for a defense that had been just um, ragged on and uh, hated on and <laughs> had shade thrown on it for, you know, a, a good portion of the season, especially there in that kind of middle stretch, really bounced back and, and did some good things later in the year. Some of that, yes, you could say, hey, it's it's about the opponent. It's about who you played. You played at williams Bryce Stadium, friendly confines, great atmosphere. But, you know, doing it against Clemson, a team that, you know, we know maybe doesn't quite have the explosive offense that we have seen them have at times in the past. They're missing some wide receivers. But credit where it's due for doing what you needed to do if you're South Carolina's defense to give your, your team a chance. I mean, even even the field goals that Clemson hit, it's not like these are chip shots. You had a guy, the the announcer, I didn't stat check this, but SEC Network, they said essentially, you know, the Clemson kicker was like one for six from field goals over 45, I think. Um, Don't quote me on that. Basically, that was highly out of character to be hitting all those long fields. Dude, I'm I'm watching the game and I'm thinking, eventually he's going to miss one of these. Yeah. And uh, it just never happened. But point being that the defense – Kept getting stops. You know, I know Beamer said basically, hey, we didn't get the ball off of them uh, enough. That's that's probably if you're going to be nitpicky, that's maybe the one thing you sort of say. But, dude, they, they, made, they made Clemson earn every yard, I, I think. And my, my thought going in was that I thought Clemson would have some success running the football, which they did. But I, I just felt like, hey, you can't let them just dominate the the game on the ground to the extent we saw like two years ago where Clemson just said, hey, we're going to get the ball to Shipley. We're going to make explosive plays in the running game. We're not going to have to throw the ball. Um, they, they really made Clemson grind out drives, and they got off the field. And, you know, I thought it was a fantastic game plan because they said, look, we're going to s- sit in this 3-3-5. They played, once again, a lot more zone than we're used to seeing them play, uh, you know, for most of the year. And because they were able to stop the run without always bringing an extra safety into the box, they just said, we're going to put all eyes on Klubnik. We're going to drop these guys back into these zones, and we're going to make him prove that he can sit back there, read what we're doing, and complete passes to a receiving core that is banged up and Frank former Navy SEAL Sean Ryan shares real stories from real people from all walks of life on the Sean Ryan show Tennessee Congressman Tim Burchett where do the majority of UAP sightings happen yeah they, you know military installations but I, I couch that I mean if they're going to fly here and check something out they're going to see where our best and brightest are I would assume they asked me about about seeing any UFOs in Washington DC and I said no I said there's no intelligent life <laughs> The Sean Ryan Show on YouTube or wherever you listen. Not very explosive at this exact moment. If you look through the stats, you know, Clemson ends up with 233 rushing yards. And if you look at that after the game and had not watched, you meant, man, they just got destroyed. They just ran the ball all over them. And, the, and it really wasn't the case. If you're getting extremely nitpicky about the defense, which I don't want to do, you know, because, again, if you hold a team with no touchdown, we, we don't need to talk anymore. Yeah. We don't need to talk. Like, that's that's it, right? So You had them out of the red zone. We're, we're getting into nitpick territory. You did exactly what you needed to do because, like you said, Wes, you forced a kicker who's not been good all year 
to, okay, you need to hit a 49, a 50, and a 42. He hit all of them. Hey, tip your cap, right? You don't, you, you don't even want to give him those opportunities, but you'll, you'll live with that. And you'll certainly not just live with, but celebrate the fact that you didn't give up a touchdown. Clemson gets, you know, kind of, they're, they're knocking on the door a little bit down there. And then you get the big pick from Nicky Minori. You gave the one explosive passing play down the field. You got called for P.I. Tyler Brown from Greenville. He made a great catch. But you did your job. The one extreme nitpick is, again, Clemson did have some rushing yards. Some of them were were piled up later when the game was basically over. But they were able to run it just well enough at times to where they either got into field goal range or they had to punt. They didn't punt from their own 20. 25. They moved the ball a little bit. Defense got the stop, but now the problem is Gamecock offense is backed up because they have a good punter in Aiden Swanson, and that flipped the field. You weren't able to move the chains as an offense. Again, that's up to the offense. You, you got to, at some point, you got to be able to move the chains, and even if you end up punting, you need to be able to flip the field. So not only were they not able to score enough, aside from the, the one offensive touchdown, they weren't able to move the ball enough to where they could play, you know, complimentary football and, and ultimately give themselves some more favorable uh, downs and distances, yes, but also field position. Well, and talking about the offense continuing to go three and out, that wears on your defense where they've already been out there for a drive. Offense goes out there for a total of two minutes of real time, and then guess what? The defense is back on the field, and that's something that's going to wear and wear on you, especially when you're going up against a team that continues to run the ball because that's those physical plays down in the trenches that wear on a defense, and it did wear on South Carolina. But, again, all the things considered, like you said, kept them out of the red zone minus the couple of plays at the end of the game where they're just running the clock out. And, um, you know, for, for a defense that has gotten better as the year's gone along, and, you know, people bring up the question of why – why do they wait so long to implement the three three five as their base defense as it has been a part of their packages the entire year, but they seem to have found success in these last couple of games of doing that more than the traditional four two five. Is that something to build off of? We'll see. But um, you know, the defense did improve as the season went along and perhaps one of their best performances on Saturday night. Yeah, I thought some of Clemson sort of being able to get those little they're not chunk plays, those just little tiny positive plays and, and kind of staying on the field. I, I would say some of that was probably game plan um, dependent. Like, I, I think some of that was because that was just how South Carolina sort of played it. They they did give Clemson a little bit of room to operate, but they said, look, we're going to keep everything in front. We're going to keep all eyes on the football. And that, I think, served also as a way they were trying to keep uh, Kate Klubnick in the pocket. That seemed to be a huge part of what they were trying to do. He did get a few really good runs on them that I, I thought extended drives. And I, I thought, you know, honestly, he he did not have a great day throwing the football. He he may have been the difference in this football game and his running ability. These His 52 yards on 11 carries um, might have been the difference in the game. W- would y'all believe also that when you're just looking at running backs that South Carolina had the longest run of the game, Mario Anderson's 19-yarder? Clemson's running backs had a long of 12 and 14. And so, really, South Carolina just said, hey, we're we're going to make you kind of just grind this thing out. And it, it was the definition of bend, don't break. The problem was South Carolina's offense wasn't able to turn around and, and kind of help you out. Another, another reason, again, hindsight, another reason you look at that fourth down decision and, hey, when do you make your last stand here? The fact, like Tyler just said, your defense had been on the field for so long. You're asking them, yeah, you're you're pinning them back, but you're asking them, all right, guys, we, we need another stop, and we're putting you right back out there. And I believe Shipley ripped off. Actually, his longest was 14. That might have been his longest run of the game because uh, I know he ripped one off on first or second down from the 10-yard line right after the punt. So... Uh, just was not the result they were looking for when they tried to finally kind of flip the field there. Well, and you look at, you know, I don't want to say it was the only, I would need to double check that, but you think about before the half, right? South Carolina's basically in a two minute situation. They get the ball back uh, with a minute 26 left, and you have a couple positive plays. You run for five yards, uh, you hit a 15 yard pass from Rattler. Now you're in third and five. 
right near midfield, and you're thinking to yourself, hey, you know, we got a chance. You're down 13-7. Let's think at least about getting into field goal range here. Well, instead of that, third and five, you get sacked. Now you're loss of 13. Now you're punting the football away instead of, you know, being able to maybe have a chance to at least go get three there. So even in the uh, even in the situations where they had some favorable field position, which was not often in this game, you know, you just weren't able to capitalize on it. Absolutely. We'll give our final thoughts on what we saw Saturday night and uh, look ahead to what's coming next as the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs rolls on on your reaction Monday here on the game. Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs. On this Reaction Monday here on the game, as well as the 107.5 The Game app, you can download the 107.5 The Game app on the App Store and listen to us wherever you are. Saturday's loss to Clemson brings the end to the Gamecocks season at 5-7, and seven, and they will not be going to a bowl game. Coach Beamer on Saturday after the game talking about the tough year that it was. Well, it was certainly emotional in there and tough in there. We got a great group of guys, and... Um, that have been through a lot of adversity this season and never flinched. That's continued. Um, you know, we've used the expression "just keep staying in the fight," and uh, our guys have stayed in the fight all year long. Um, you know, to have as many injuries as we had, particularly at one position on the offensive line, to be starting five true freshmen, have some of the heartbreaking losses that we've had. You know, they've they just they never flinched and proud as heck of them. Got a great group of guys, but you know, certainly it's emotional because we got some seniors that have given a lot to this university and a lot to this program, and and uh, really, 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 you know, hurt for them that we couldn't, you know, send them um, send them out on a on a better note tonight. And look, we have an entire off season to to talk about what's next and what's ahead. But but kind of looking back on this season as a whole, and you know when you looked at like the FPI in the summer of where they thought South Carolina was going to be win wise, it was right around that five six mark, which is what ended up happening, obviously. But you know when you look back, there's going to be a lot of what could have been. Certain look at that Florida game as one that you let slip through your fingers. Some plays here and there, you said if this goes differently or that goes differently, maybe we're talking about a six win, maybe we're talking about a seventh win. But at the end of the day, you are what your record says it is, and for South Carolina, that's five and seven. Yeah, I think a lot of people are obviously here in Columbia disappointed with the season. Shane Beamer disappointed with the season. I do think if you zoom out, and I'm in no way saying this should have been your expectation, that you should have low expectations or anything like that. So uh, don't misrepresent it. I'm not saying that at all. But if you zoom out, this is actually kind of what Vegas expected from South Carolina. The the overrun of the win-loss total was right around this number, and – you know, as always, you can kind of go back in a season and pinpoint a couple of things that, hey, if it goes differently, you know, it's a completely different year. And I'm not trying to if away the record, like if this, if that, because there are always games that could go the other way as well. You look at the the end of that Jacksonville State game. Um, you know, you're you're one bad play away from them scoring a touchdown and really, you know, putting the brakes on your season. The other side. Of course, you you look at these sort of what we deemed toss-up games. The one of those that truly became like a kind of one-play toss-up game ended up being Florida, where you said, hey, if you make literally one more play, you you win the game. And so, in in some ways, guys, the difference in last year and this year, at least from a record standpoint, is you face North Carolina to start the season instead of Georgia State. So that's that's one, if we're kind of just playing magician here, that's one game that that could have been a win instead, and then the the Florida game as well. So, are, are we? If you make one play against Florida and you schedule a cupcake to start the year, and you're sitting here at seven and five instead of five and seven, you know what what is the conversation like? And, and I'm not saying that in, in any. You're five and seven. That is the record, but I'm just saying it's really not that far off from what people outside of Columbia really expected and i i do kind of my my brain keeps going back to those all those times in the off season when shane beamer the most positive person i've maybe ever seen <laughs> kept saying hey guys you know we're gonna be playing a lot of true freshmen you know we're playing a lot of true freshmen and that that doesn't even get into of course all the offensive line injuries and the injury to juice wells and all that's true and at the same time, there is going to be a segment of the fan base, and, and I get it, it's fair, that says, I don't really care. You know, I don't care that Vegas 
says we were going to win five games, three games, zero games, 12 games, like whatever, like just just be better. And and I get that too. And so, look, win, bowl game or no bowl game, win or loss against Clemson, win or loss against Florida, this was shaping up to be a critical offseason because guess what? You got another tough schedule next year. That's the case every year, but if you haven't looked at it yet. It might even be tougher than this year. It might be tougher than this year. Probably on, pa- is. on paper, it on absolutely paper it is. is. And, and by some metrics, this is the toughest schedule in the country this year. Yep. Right? So it was already going to be a critical offseason because you got another tough schedule. It doesn't let up. And you obviously have some things that need to improve with this program and with this team. I think the way that this year went down the stretch, losing to Clemson, it just kind of amplified that. But if you had beat Clemson the other night, 16 to 7, whatever the score, if you'd eked out a win there, this it didn't change the offseason outlook and that there's the portal is going to be huge. This recruiting class is going to be huge. Assessing the staff for Shane Beamer, that's going to be huge. There's still a lot of work to do here and and that that really remains the case. Absolutely. And plenty of things to get into as the offseason begins for South Carolina. Transfer portal early signing day on the horizon. We'll certainly get into all of it as the offseason rolls along, but Five and seven, the year for South Carolina in 2023, and I'll focus ahead to next season. That'll do it for today's edition of the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour, presented by Firehouse Subs. Halftime show with myself and Terry Ford coming up next here on The Game. The football season is underway, and Believe Podcasts are talking about it. When he went home and went to sleep, Michael Parsons was just terrorizing him. Believe has podcasts covering all 32 professional teams and many of your favorite college teams, too. And to be only producing 15 points a game, that's something that is definitely disheartening. Sideline to sideline, end zone to end zone. As a quarterback, I would expect him to be acting like that. Take the accountability. Put that on yourself. Don't put it on your teammates. Search B-L-E-A-V Podcasts wherever you listen.